Welcome back to Skyrim Storytime. We're going to be continuing the story of Decimus Scotty in A Dance in Fire, Chapter 4, by Wagen Jarth. 18 Bosmuri and one Cyrodiilic former senior clerk from an Imperial Building Commission trudged through the jungle westward from the Xylo River to the ancient village of Vindisi. For Decimus Scotty, the jungle was hostile, unfamiliar ground. The enormous vermic vermiculated trees filled the bright morning with darkness and resembled nothing so much as grasping claws bent on impeding their progress. Even the fronds of the low plants quivered with malevolent energy. What was worse, he was not alone in his anxiety. His fellow travelers, the natives who had survived the Khajiiti attack on the villages of Grenos and Athe, wore faces of undisguised fear. There was something sentient in the jungle, and not merely the mad but benevolent indigenous spirits. In his peripheral vision, Scotty could see the shadows of the Khajiiti following the refugees, leaping from tree to tree. When he turned to face them, the lithe forms vanished in the gloom, as if they had never been there. But he knew he had seen them, and then the Bosmuri saw them too, and quickened their pace. After eighteen hours, bitten raw by insects, scratched by a thousand thorns, they emerged into a valley clearing. It was night, but a row of blazing torches greeted them, illuminating the leather, wrought tents, and jumbled stones of the hamlet of Vindisi. At the end of the valley, the torches marked a sacred site, a gnarled bower of trees pressed close together to form a temple. Wordlessly, the Bosmuri walked the torches arcade toward the trees. Wordlessly, the Bosmuri walked the torch arcade toward the trees. Scotty followed them. When they reached the solid mass of living wood with only one gaping portal, Scotty could see a dim blue light glowing within. A low, sonorous moan from a hundred voices echoed within. The Bosmuri maiden he had been following held, up, held out her hand, stopping him. You do not understand, but no outsider, not even a friend, may enter, she said. This is a holy place. Scotty nodded and watched the refugees march into the temple, heads bowed. Their voices joined with the ones within. When the last wood elf had gone inside, Scotty turned his attention back to the village. There must be food to be had somewhere. A tendril of smoke and a faint whiff of roasting venison beyond the torchlight led him. They were five Cyrodiils, two Bretons, and a Nord. The group gathered around a campfire of glowing white stones, pulling steaming strips of meat from the cadaver of a great stag. At Scotty's approach, they rose up, all but the Nord, who was distracted by his hunk of animal flesh. Good evening, sorry to interrupt, but I was wondering if I might have a little something to eat. I'm afraid I'm rather hungry, after walking all day with some refugees from Grenos and Athe. They bade him to sit down and eat, and introduce themselves. So the war's back on, it seems, said Scotty amiably. Best thing for these... Effort, do-nothings, replied the Nord in between bites. Excuse me. Best thing for these effort do nothings, replied the Nord in between bites. I've never seen such a lazy culture. Now they've got the Khajiiti striking them on land and the high elves at sea. If there's any province that deserves a little distress, it's damnable Valenwood. I don't see how they're so offensive to you, laughed one of the Bretons. They're congenital thieves, even worse than the Khajiiti because they are so blessed, blessed meek in their aggression. The Nords spat out a gob of fat which sizzled on the hot stones of the fire. They spread their forests into territory that doesn't belong to them, slowly infiltrating their neighbors, and they're puzzled when elsewhere shoves back at them. They're all villains of the worst order. What are you doing here? asked Scotty. I'm a diplomat from the court of Jehenna, muttered the Nord, returning to his food. What about you? What are you doing here? asked one of the Cyrodiils. I work for Lord Atreus's building commission in the Imperial City, said Scotty. One of my former colleagues suggested that I come down to Valenwood. He said the war was over, and I, can con I could contract a great deal of business for my firm rebuilding what was lost. One disaster after another, and I've lost all my money. I'm in the middle of a rekindling of war, and I cannot find my former colleague. Your former colleague, murmured another of the Cyrodiils, who had introduced himself as Reglius. He wasn't by any chance named Leodes Juris, was he? You know him? He lured me down to Valenwood in nearly the exact same circumstances, smiled Reglius grimly. 
I worked for your employer's competitor, Lord Vanek's men, where Leotis Juris also formerly worked. He wrote to me asking that I represent an Imperial Building Commission and contract some post-war construction. I had just been released from my employment, and I thought that if I had brought some new business, I could have my job back. Juris and I met in Athe, and he said he was going to arrange a very lucrative meeting with the Sylvanar. Sylvanar. Scotty was stunned. Where is he now? I'm no theologian, so I couldn't say, Reglia shrugged. He's dead. When the Khajiiti attacked Arthe, they began by torching the harbor where Juris was readying his boat. Or, I should say, my boat, since it was purchased with the gold I brought. By the time we were even aware of what was happening enough to flee, everything by the water was ash. The Khajiiti may be animals, but they know how to arrange an attack. I think they followed us through the jungle to Vindisi, said Scotty nervously. There was definitely a group of something jumping along the treetops. Probably one of the monkey folk, snorted the Nord. Nothing to be concerned about. When we first came to Vindisi and the Bosmuri all entered that tree, they were furious, whispering something about unleashing an ancient terror on their enemies, the Breton shivered, remembering. They've been there ever since, for over a day and a half now. If you want something to be afraid of, that's the direction to look. The other Breton, who was a representative of the Daggerfall Mages Guild, was staring off into the darkness while his fellow provincial spoke. Maybe. But there's something in the jungle, too, right on the edge of the village, looking in. More refugees, maybe? asked Scotty, trying to keep the alarm out of his voice. Not unless they're traveling through the trees now, whispered the wizard. The Nord and one of the Cyrodiils grabbed a long tarp of wet leather and pulled it across the fire instantly extinguishing it without so much as a sizzle. Now Scotty could see the intruders, their elliptical yellow eyes and long, cruel blades catching the torchlight. He froze with fear, praying that he too was not so visible to them. He felt something bump against his back, and he gasped. Reglius's voice hissed from up above. Be quiet for Mara's sake, and climb up here. Scotty grabbed hold of the knotted double vine that hung down from the tall tree at the edge of the dead campfire. He scrambled up as quickly as he could, holding his breath lest any grunt of exertion escape him. At the top of the vine, high above the village, was an abandoned nest from some great bird in a trident-shaped branch. As soon as Scotty had pulled himself into the soft, fragrant straw, Reglius pulled up the vine. No one else was there, and when Scotty looked down, he could see no one below. No one, that is except the Khajiiti, slowly moving towards the glow of the temple tree. Thank you, whispered Scotty, deeply touched that a competitor had helped him. He turned away from the village and saw that the tree's upper branches brushed against the mossy rock walls that surrounded the valley below. How are you at climbing? You're mad, said Reglius under his breath. We should stay here until they leave. If they burn Vindisi like they did Athe and Grenis, we'll be dead for sure as if we were on the ground. Scotty began to s the slow, careful climb up the tree, testing each branch. Can you see what they're doing? I can't really tell, Reglius stared down into the gloom. They're at the front of the temple. I think they also have... It looks like long ropes, trailing off behind them, off into the pass. Scotty crawled into the strongest branch that pointed toward the wet, rocky face of the cliff. It was not a far jump at all. So close, in fact, that he could smell the moisture and feel the coolness of the stone. But it was a jump, none the, nevertheless. And in his history as a clerk, he had never before leapt from a tree a hundred feet off the ground to a sheer rock. He pictured in his mind's eye the shadows that had pursued him through the jungle from the heights above. How their legs coiled to spring, how their arms snapped forward in an elegant, fluid motion to grasp. He leapt. His hands grappled for rock, but long, thick cords of moss were more accessible. He held hard, but when he tried to plant his feet toward, forward, they slipped up skyward. For a few seconds, he found himself upside down before he managed to pull himself into a more convenient, con conventional position. There was a narrow outcropping jutting out of the cliff where he could stand up and finally exhale. Reglius! 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 Scotty did not dare to call out. In a minute, there was a shaking of branches and Lord Vanek's man emerged. First his satchel, then his head, then the rest of him. 
Scotty started to whisper something, but Regulus shook his head violently and pointed downward. One of the Kanjidi was at the base of the tree, peering at the remains of the campfire. Reglius awkwardly tried to balance himself on the branch, but as strong as it was, it was exceedingly difficult with only one free hand. Scotty cupped his palms and then pointed at the satchel. It seemed to pain Reglius to let it out of his grasp, but he relented and tossed it to Scotty. There was a small, almost invisible hole in the bag, and when Scotty caught it, a single gold coin dropped out. It rang as it bounced against the rock wall on the descent, a high, soft sound that seemed like the loudest alarm Scotty had ever heard. Then many things happened very quickly. The cafe rat at the base of the tree looked up and gave a loud wail. The other Kajidi followed in chorus as the cat below crouched down and then sprung up into the lower branches. Reglius saw it below him, climbing up with impossible dexterity, and panicked. Even before he jumped, Scotty could tell that he was going to fall. With a cry, Reglius the clerk plunged to the ground, breaking his neck on impact. A flash of white fire erupted from every crevice of the temple, and the moan of the Bosmuri prayer changed into something terrible and otherworldly. The climbing Cathay Rot stopped and stared. Kirgul, it gasped. The wild hunt. It was as if a crack in reality had opened wide. A flood of horrific beasts, tentacled toads, insects of armor and spine, gelatinous serpents, vaporous beings without, with the face of gods, all poured forth from the great hollow tree, blind with fury. They tore the Khajidi in front of the temple to pieces. All the other cats fled for the jungle, but as they did so, they began pulling on the ropes they carried. In a few seconds' time, the entire village of Vindisi was boiling with the lo lunatic apparitions of the wild hunt. Over the babbling, barking, howling horde, Scotty heard the Cyrodiils in hiding cry out as they were devoured. The Nord, too, was found and eaten, and both Bretons. The wizard had turned himself invisible, but the swarm did not rely on their sight. The tree the Cathay Rot was in began to sway and rock from the impossible violence beneath it. Scotty looked at the Khajidi's fear-struck eyes and held out one of the cords of moss. The cat's face showed its pitiful gratitude as it leapt for the vine. It didn't have time to entirely replace that expression when Scotty pulled back the cord and watched it fall. The hunt consumed it to the bone before it struck the ground. Scotty's own jump up to the next outcropping of rock was immeasurably more successful. From there, he pulled himself to the top of the cliff and was able to look down into the chaos that had been the village of Vindisi. The hunt's mass had grown and began, had grown and began to spill out through the pass of the valley, pursuing the fleeing Kajiri. It was then that the madness truly began. In the moon's light, from Scotty's vantage, he could see where the Kajiri had attached their ropes. With a thunderous boom, an avalanche of boulders poured over the pass. When the dust cleared, he saw that the valley had been sealed. The wild hunt had no nowhere to turn but on itself. Scotty turned his head, unable to bear to look at the cannibalistic orgy. The night jungle stood before him, a web of wood. He slugged Reglius' satchel over his shoulder and entered. Alright. I think we have one more to go. Can I just, like, add a couple of comments? Uh, so... Where was the part where everybody else around the campfire went and hid? Because that seemed to have been skipped before he climbed up the tree. And also, that was messed up, offering that moss cord and then pulling it away before he could catch it. Horrible. We're going to continue in the next video. See you then, and good night.